Sometimes, despite your best efforts, your recovery gets derailed. Powerful life triggers, a lack of support, a wrong turn. Relapse happens, it's frustrating, but the important thing is to not wait another day to get back on track. Foundations Recovery Network is here to help with more than a dozen outpatient programs and six residential treatment centers to choose from. Our co-occurring treatment model gets to the root of your addiction, putting you back on the road to recovery. Call 877-714-1318 to reach our confidential helpline 24-7. We're waiting by the phone. That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. What's up? Thank you for tuning in today. Thanks to Humans for bringing us in. And thank you to you for supporting the show. Uh, It's great to bring you Sober Guy Radio up from Northern California. Thank you to everybody for supporting the recovery movement. Really an honor to be a part of it. Uh, I'm definitely excited to announce Sober Guy Radio will be down podcasting from the Innovations in Recovery Conference down in San Diego. That's April 3rd through the 6th. And um, big thanks to Foundations Recovery Network for obviously hosting the event. Uh, as well as sponsoring the show and bringing Sober Guy down uh, to do some podcasting, meet some great people, and uh, learn some things uh, more about the recovery industry. So if you'd like more information about that, uh, you can go to foundationsevents.com slash innovations in recovery. Uh, we got a great guest today, and we're going to get to her in just a minute. But first, I want to tell you about a new treatment program called DXRX. So DXRX provides access to alcohol treatment specialists, Uh, safe medication and ongoing monitoring for people who want to stop or reduce their drinking. And it's all done through a simple phone app. Uh, Here's what will happen on your first appointment. Before you start the program, you'll meet with a physician who's a specialist in addiction, and uh, you'll discuss your goals for drinking, your health history, any concerns you might have. And uh, then the physician will create a personalized care plan for you. And you can monitor your progress with the breathalyzer and of course the DXRX mobile app. Uh, The physician will recommend safe, effective, non-habit-forming medicine uh, that'll ease the alcohol cravings. And uh, Jess and I visited the DXRX team a couple months back. Uh, They're right uh, right from here in the Bay Area. Uh, They're a great group of doctors and professionals. And um, we had some dinner with them. We got to see the facility. I've talked about it a number of times and uh, really are excited to support them and uh, help them take uh, this new treatment to the next level. And uh, really, really honored to do that. So if you'd like more information, go to thatsoberguy.com. You'll see the DXRX logo, Stronger Than Alcohol. And you can click on the logo to get started today. All right, let me take a breath real quick. I've had plenty of coffee today and uh, seems to get me through the day and whatever works. So I'm excited to introduce a very well-known guest today, Claudia Christian. Claudia has been in the film and television business as a performer for over 30 years. She starred in basically every movie or show that you've seen in the 80s and 90s. And uh, you may well know her, uh, sci-fi fans, I'm sorry, know her around the world for, uh, for her work on the Hugo Award winning show Babylon 5. Uh, she's the author of two autobiographical autobi- books, My Life with Freaks and Geeks and Babylon Confidential, and also the novel A Wolf's Empire. She's the most recognized advocate for the Sinclair method, and that's something we're going to talk about today, which I'm super excited to talk about. I'm learning some new things about it. Claudia is an expert in it, and and we're going to get into that. Um, uh, The Sinclair method has a 78% long-term success rate that's proven over in over 120 peer-reviewed clinical trials. So in 2013, Claudia started her nonprofit C3 Foundation, uh, that's c3foundation.org, to help raise awareness of the treatment. Uh, which saved her life in 2009. Her foundation is based primarily in the U.S. and has an international reach of over a million people. And Claudia personally counsels hundreds of individuals 
and their loved ones. If I was to go down the rest of your bio, Claudia, I think we'd be here for the rest of the week. So I'm going to stop right there and say uh, hi to you and welcome to the show. How are you today? Uh, I'm great, Shane. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a it's it's not a very concise bio, is it? I love it. There's so there's so much stuff, and like like I said, uh, your work is so extensive. Um, you know, I mean, I, I was going down the list in. Uh, in, in some of the, um, some of the work that, that you've done in movies and television shows, even, uh, I noticed, um, uh, games, too. games. Yeah. Games. Yeah. And I was, I was doing a little, little, little homework yesterday and I came across, uh, across the clean radio interview. And I, I found out on there that you also were the voice for the Jaguar commercial. Is that right? <laughs> yes, I, yes. I was yes. the Jaguar for years. That was a great gig. Let me tell you, I wish I, I wish I had that. I wish I had that gig right now. That would be, uh, that would be helpful in supporting my nonprofit yeah. organization. That yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah. And I, I love the, uh, the accent. You said you did a terrible job at that. I thought it was a wonderful accent. You know, it, well, it, it was, it, it's an, it's an interesting thing because I do a lot of transatlantic accent work in games mm -hmm. and in commercials. And if for Brits, it's not really a British accent and for Americans, it's not really an American or a British accent, but <laughs> a lot of times they don't want it to, you know, they don't want it too extreme. So they want my sort of transatlantic and I work a lot with that voice. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not going to lose it. You know, <laughs> it works. I mean, you know, if a giant corporation like Jaguar thought it was acceptable, then, then far be it for me to, to, uh, yeah, you know, why not? listen to the naysayers. Right. Do you ever right? just jump out in, in a certain accent and not expect it and go, wait a minute. Oh, cause there, cause there's so many of them. Uh, you know, I do have a tendency the second I landed at Heathrow to suddenly sort of uh, all of a sudden I'm speaking like this, you know, so it's so nice to be home, you know. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. Uh, and when I'm in Germany with my relatives, I, I start to sort of sound a little bit German, you know, just soften the vowels and things. So, I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. My mother has a very thick accent, even though she's been here since the 1950s. So it's it's uh, it's an easy thing to pick up when you're from a when you're first generation American. <laughs> I have yeah. a lot of influence yeah various sounds well i want to enjoy it i want to jump into you and um i'm going to kind of stop and and like i said you're very well known work is extensive you're doing some great work in uh, the recovery industry and trying to bring a lot of awareness to the sinclair method which i think um was i was super interested as soon as i heard you and john from dxrx talk a little bit about mm -hmm. it and I kind of um, kind of dove into that, and uh, um, let me kind of let me kind of let you take over for a minute. Tell us, for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, what you're up to today. Okay, well, um, I, uh, from an addiction point of view, I developed alcohol use disorder in my late 30s, early 40s, and I tried pretty much everything: traditional treatment, rehab, uh, AA in two countries, 17 different meetings. Um, I did hypnotherapy, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. I did vitamin therapy. I stopped short at electroshock therapy, um, <laughs> but I, I, I pretty much. Uh, pretty I understand much a thirty thousand dollar rehab experience to drink weed. Yeah. grass and practice tai chi as well yeah i did that in the uh, up near up near you in northern california oh, and that was a, it. it was just to me it was a complete waste of time energy and money because it wasn't fixing what i felt was the biological addiction issue yeah. um which was the the you know i would suffer i would i would be sober for a long period of time and then suffer from al uh, alcohol deprivation effect which was yeah. intense cravings and and of course the the little lizard addict brain which tells you that you're not in the, <laughs> you're you're not an addict so uh you can have a drink and then you relapse into a binge and so it was <laughs> and so it was a, a never ending cycle of um you know much like to me the revolving door of addiction treatment it was the revolving door of binge sober binge sober binge sobriety yeah. so um so eventually uh i i went to my one person only um medical detox and on the way out i for uh something called vivitrol which is a shot of of what i then found out was naltrexone so i googled it and i researched it and i thought do i really want this in my body 24 hours a day no but the naltrexone aspect of it sounded very interesting and through Google search, I found this book which, with the very sort of uh, snake oil uh, title of <laughs> The Cure for Alcoholism, which yeah. sounded like <laughs> too good to me. I researched it and um, I found this book by Dr. Roy Escapa and I read it and uh, I come from a family of scientists and doctors. So it made sense to me. Yeah. The book made sense to me. Um, it was talking about something called targeted pharmacological extinction. 
um, which involves taking an, an FDA approved opiate blocker. In this case, in the United States, it's called naltrexone and it's oral naltrexone. So you take a tablet an hour before you have a drink and over time your cravings diminish and your desire to drink diminishes and you can either uh, reach, you can become abstinent or you can reduce your drinking to safe levels. So it's harm reduction or it's also a path to sobriety. It depends on what you personally want. Yeah. Um, this made a lot of sense to me. And uh, back in 2009, I, I couldn't find a doctor who would prescribe it, which is still unfortunately really difficult today um, for individuals. But I ordered my naltrexone online from a pharmacy in India, and it re I received it about a month and a half later. So I had been sober at that point for about three months. Um, so I was three months sober and I started the Sinclair method and I, I was what's called an immediate responder, meaning that I poured myself a glass of wine and I, I literally couldn't finish it. I had no interest in it. Really? Now that is, not, yeah, that's not indicative of the entire eight years that I've been on it at all. That was simply my beginning experiences. Um, it then went into sort of uh, very little drinking, very light drinking. And then there was some times that I was more of a social drinker. And then there was times that I was abstinent. So it goes in, in ebbs and flows. And what I realize is it mimics what I was in my 20s before the addiction crept in. So it's so, right. somewhat like Somebody on the Sinclair Method will say to me, look, I've been on it for a year and last weekend I drank a lot. And I said, well, what was last weekend? They said, well, it was my friend's birthday party. And I said, OK, well, <laughs> prior prior to, you know, having an alcohol use disorder, did you ever have a night where you tied one on? And, you know, he or she would say, yeah. And I'd say, OK, well, there you go. It's it's not something to be yeah. concerned about as long as you apply. So what it does is it really it reverts you back to the sort of drinker that you were prior to the addiction creeping into your brain. Or, like I said, you can choose complete sobriety and use this to eliminate uh, cravings and the compulsive behavior that is associated with an alcohol use disorder. And then you can return to a 12-step program or, or AA or safe or hams or whatever, whatever yeah. rocks your boat. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, that's the lovely thing about this is that I find that there's so many people that have, I, I get the people, one, that traditional treatment didn't work for, or two, that re really have a need, a strong need for privacy. And that's in, they could lose their job, airline pilots, uh, police officers, lawyers, doctors, all of these people have a strong need for privacy. So this really is, is great for them. And then yeah. the people who, who are chronic relapsers in 12 step programs, this is great for them because they can, like I said, let's eliminate the addiction in the brain, the biological addiction is so that you can focus on the meetings when you're in the meeting you can actually listen to it and you're not thinking i want to drink i want to drink i want to drink you know so, <laughs> yeah. uh, so this that's the nice thing is there's no more white knuckling and this is this is this is lovely for people who who need that extra um that extra little step involved in 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 trying to uh you know really achieve recovery long lasting recovery yeah yeah, and and one of the things I thought that I thought was interesting too, and uh, from your from your TEDx talk, and we'll place that in the show notes too, folks, so you guys can uh, can check that out. Um, you had said because I I'm a firm believer too that not not every not every program is for everybody, and that goes with anything in life. Or not people respond differently to different things, right? Absolutely. Whether it's treatment or whatever. So so something that works for some one person might not work for the next person. And I found it really interesting that you said, you know, that you weren't suffering from any personal trauma or, or like a shitty childhood. You were drinking because you were physically addicted to alcohol. And yes. I had a, I had a conversation with, with a buddy of mine at, uh, we went out to breakfast this morning and we were kind of touching on this about, about how, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities and that's one thing we want to make sure that we look for, you know, with addiction, but at the same time, people's, people's, um, people's levels and people's situations are obviously different. Can you, can you explain that a little bit, how it, it was more of a physical, a physical thing for you and how, Absolutely, and yeah. how the Sinclair, because I think that ties into a lot with how the Sinclair method works. Well, a lot of people in, in um, various, you know, in, in doctors, physicians, um, researchers, biologists, uh, they, they, they like to refer to addiction as something called a learned behavior. So I don't want to play semantics. And I, those of you out there who believe it's a disease, uh, fine. The only people that I won't listen to are people who say it's a moral failing. That's yeah. all. But, but, but if you want to call it a disease, that's fine. If you want to call it a, a learned behavior, that's fine. But if you look at it as a learned behavior in a rather Pavlovian way, then you can look at um, targeted pharmacological extinction as un learning the behavior 
behavior that is that now, now mind you they've done brain scans of before and after people on, on Sinclair method prior and after and you can see the difference in the brain because the neural pathways are so enlarged and engorged and, and heightened uh, when you are suffering from an, uh, an alcohol addiction that you can actually physically see that the brain pattern looks different. And then after the brain has been treated with psychological extinction, you can see the neural pathways go back to normal. Um, so when when somebody let's OK, when I started drinking, let's say in my in my early 20s, I was I was disinterested, to say the least. I just yeah. you know, it was it was enjoyable once in a blue moon if somebody. Somebody said, you want a glass of wine? Oh, okay. But it wasn't fine. something you were going to chase after no. and like really looking for. You really care less. Absolutely. Exactly. So, so you don't go into a bar. There's very few people who are spontaneous, um, spontaneously addicted to alcohol. And those are yeah. people who find such a strong reward from the very first time they take a sip of alcohol that yes, they become addicted very quickly. But in my case, it wasn't, it took 20 years for this to develop. So that means every time I drank, there was a reward and in my my particular reward system of the brain um, would release a lot of endorphins and then that would make the neural pathway stronger. So in, in essence, what you're looking at is somebody with a genetic predisposition. And I have addiction in my family on both sides. Um, and so I have that. And then I engaged in the behavior. So I engaged in the behavior of drinking. Now, had I I've gambled before and I've done other high risk uh, potentially addictive behaviors and I've never become addicted. You know, I did, yeah. uh, I tried cocaine. I never became addicted to that. I tried pot. I never became addicted to that. You know, I could take or leave caffeine cigarettes, none of that. So for me, it was just alcohol. Yeah. So, so when, when working with, with an individual who is a, what I call a biological addict, um, the pill really simply does, whether you want to believe it or not, it does the trick if yeah. you comply. So, so, but then you've got this myriad of other people, you've got these snowflakes. I mean, there's so many different reasons why people drink. And if somebody has, is drinking because of childhood trauma or because of, uh, you know, they're going through a divorce or a child passed or, or some sort of traumatic event or because, you know, they, they want to black out at night. I have people who in broken relationships who just, you know, they, they just, they just want to disappear for a while. Um, those people need to do a dual therapy and they definitely need to do some sort of processing, whether it's psychotherapy or, or so, so for those out there listening who might not understand what dual therapy is, can you give a quick, quick rundown of what that would in, entail? I would say cognitive behavioral therapy, some sort of therapy, whether it's a, a group therapy or whether it's, um, uh, if your goal is abstinence, I believe that you can attend, um, I believe that you can attend AA or any other 12 step meeting while you're doing the Sinclair method, because mm -hmm. what is the first rule? If the, the rule is you can attend if you have the desire to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And I, and I believe people, there are some people on the Sinclair method whose desire is to to, is abstinence. Yeah. So I don't see why they can't attend meetings. So if you if, if you can't afford a psychotherapist, why not go to some sort of uh, group meeting or, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, affordable therapy, but I definitely think that they have to do internal work. So dual therapy would mean doing um, pharmaceutical and psychological therapy at the same time. So you would be on a medication like naltrexone, um, I prefer the way that it's done in targeted pharmacological extinction with the Sinclair method, which means that you take it one hour prior to the first drink of the day every time you drink. And you, there's other aspects of it that are important. You need to be mindful when you're drinking so that you don't fall back into the same old habitual drinking. Yeah. Um, you need to keep a drink log. I mean, this is the thing is, if you drink every day at six o'clock, then it's going to be really helpful if you stagger that time. Take the pill at six. Don't start drinking till seven. Um, also, the, the, the dual therapy aspect of the Sinclair method, not talking about psychotherapy, um, is that on your alcohol free days, you, if you engage in good endorphin producing activities, you're actually heightening the, um, the, 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 the desire to do those things. So for yeah. instance, when I first started, I, I did Pilates on my days off from naltrexone and off from alcohol. And I really got into Pilates. So I sort of changed addictions to something good, you know, and that's, that's the lovely thing is you strengthen that endorphin system when you when you do good things on your days off from the naltrexone and the drinking so it is that in that regard this that's the dual therapy but then when i talk about dual therapy for people who aren't just biological addicts that means adding some sort of um uh, psychotherapy um uh, or group meeting to to their the recovery yeah yeah it's 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 amazing too 
you know, in, in your example, the Pilates, um, you know, it could be a number of things for people working out, lifting weights. I mean, all kinds of different mm-hmm. things. Playing with um, dogs. Yeah. Children. Yeah. And eating spicy food. Um, uh, you know. <laughs> plenty of tapatio. No. I got to have plenty of tapatio. On hey, there. you know what? I've got a guy who started woodworking again and another one there who started ballroom dancing. I mean, whatever, whatever makes you happy. Once again, going back to what you said, you know, it's not my way or the highway. You have yeah. to personalize every single treatment for the individual. And that's why, you know, our logo is options save lives because unfortunately there's just, they're just up until now, there hasn't been many options for yeah. individuals yeah. and you can combine them in any way, shape or form that that's good for you. It's your recovery. This, you've got to find what's right for you. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. Everybody's different. And, uh, you know, it's all, it's, it's amazing when you take, when you take that energy that, that we, you know, as addicts have, and we put it into something destructive in ourselves, when when we're able to flip the script on it and put it into something positive, like Mm. woodworking for say, I mean, you can, you can build whatever you want. I mean, the, the, the possibilities are endless. And I find, um, you know, personally, and with, with a lot of people I talk to in recovery, there's a lot of great artists and a lot of great creative people with some phenomenal ideas to contribute to our society and, um, and helping people and doing service work and creating some cool things. And man, it's, it's sad when you get, you know, you see people get locked in that, uh, in that downward spiral because it happens fast and it's a very progressive, progressive thing that, uh, will, will come up and bite you in the ass real quick. And, and, and speaking of that, one of the questions I get often is, um, is relapses and, um, you know, I just had a girl, um, who wrote in the other day who was, had 50, um, you know, 50 something days and, and it was the, the same process, you know, she relapsed again and she was feeling down. And I think it's a very common thing. I think it's, it's normal number one. And I try to tell people to give themselves grace and hop back on the horse and, and get after yeah. it again. You had over 20 relapses and you had said that they got worse and worse. And I was hoping oh, yeah. you could talk a little bit about that. Well, this is the thing is because um, it, it's a it's a it's a cyclical thing. You know, you have your three months of uh, what I call the honeymoon phase of sobriety. And that's when you feel good. You look good. You're 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 full of energy. You're in that little pink cloud of sobriety. Yeah. But then what happens and this is a actual medical fact. It's a scientific you know fact that there is a thing called alcohol alcohol deprivation effect. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people that starts with the white knuckling and the craving and the obsessive thoughts and the compulsive thoughts about drinking and alcohol. And that's why you have a lot of people that are, 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 as I say, they're kind of grumpy, sober people, you know, they, 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 they're, they're they're, they're, dry drunk. Maybe I've heard that. Well, yeah, that's what they (laughs) threw out to Bill W because apparently he died begging for whiskey. I mean, he was, you know, you know, I mean, nobody wants to be that person who's sitting at a dinner party and judging everybody else because they're drinking, you know, because they're eight months sober. And that was me. I was, I was actually quite, quite miserable and, and bitchy and, and I would isolate and I wouldn't see most of my friends because they had wine cellars or they entertained and cooked and drank wine. And I, and I was angry. I had a lot of anger in me. And what happened is, is I would go my nine months. And then uh, once again, like I said, that little lizard brain would say, Oh, you're, you're not an addict. You've gone nine months without a drink. Just have one. (laughs) (laughs) And then I would have one and I'd be so, so proud of myself. I'd say, look, you just had one. And of course, you know that you know the drill. Then yeah. you go out and buy the bottle, and then you bring home the bottle, and the next thing you know, you're you're shaking in the morning. And yeah, I mean, I I, I was yep. it was progressive, and they got worse and worse, and 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 they got scarier until the very last one, which was really really scary. I mean, I I lost motor function, and I called my also I didn't know anything back in those days about tapering or naltrexone or or any medications that could that could help you through a detox. I just went cold turkey, which could have killed me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't know anything about stroking out or, or, or any of that stuff. I knew nothing. I didn't know about the beer tapers that Hams recommended. You know, I, 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 of course, since then I've learned a lot about about tapering and 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 you know people can s- successfully taper on the Sinclair method as well. They can they can use the naltrexone to taper down. Um, but I, like I said, I was completely naive. And and I find a lot of people, um, even much younger than I was when this really hit me badly, which was my early forties. Um, they're in their twenties and they're already 
discovering that these relapses could could literally kill them. I yeah. mean, they're drinking. That's the scary of, thing. But, yeah, I mean, I was a wino, thank God, because uh, you know, I, I, if I would have been pounding vodka or something, I'd be dead. Um, but I, I know a lot of people who are up to a quart of vodka a day. I mean, it's 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 just brutal and it's difficult. And it and it's it's really you know it, I want to get back to one thing or to start one subject and that is shame and stigma and it's mm. you know it is so brutal being in a, a medical detox and I'm talking about every every single um, instance and every experience that I've had uh, in hospitals and it, whether it's visiting people or being in there myself. Um, it, it, there is just absolutely no compassion and there was no grace. There was no forgiveness. There was no education. There was no hope. It was just a, a prison, a prison for somebody who is in their mind, a mess up and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, to, to, to see how we treat addicts in this country is disgusting. It's, it's, it's brutal. It's barbaric. It, it's, it, I mean, you might as well start throwing people in padded cells like they did for, you know, mental illness back in the day. I mean, it's just, it's horrible. It's comparable to that. It's it's comparable to lobotomies. I mean, it's it's just mean. It's 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 and it's not it's not helping the individual. You know, uh, it's really not helping the individual at all. And I think that there has to be a way that eventually we look at this as a condition, much like any other disease or or you yeah, know yeah. failure of the body or brain or whatever you want to call it. Is it, it, it's not the individual's fault. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I really feel like becoming an addict. It seems like fun, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know it's, it's it's not something that anybody has been asking for. Well, it's yeah, just, and I mean, I ne I never would have dreamed, you know, at, at at sixteen that I would, you know, be. It, addicted to drugs and alcohol in my you know twenties and and then be living a life in recovery. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that God has a plan for us all and that we're all in on our own on our own path. But um like you said, you know, most people don't wake up and say, damn, I can't wait to be addicted to alcohol today. Oh boy. Yeah. You know, well, it just you, doesn't work like that. No. You and I, though, have taken our personal experiences and done something that is a life plan, that is God driven, that is, you know, to, to me, that is, I wouldn't change my 10 years of suffering for anything because now I can do what I meant to do, which is to help people. And it seems like you're doing the exact same thing. Yeah. So that's a different scenario. You have a lot of people who, you know, have careers that they love that, that and have, have jobs that they love and, and just want to be normal again. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I have, I have people in the wine industry, people in, uh, the hospitality industry, restaurants, all sorts of things. And they, they will be around alcohol for the rest of their lives and they don't necessarily want to be sober for the rest of their lives. So this particular treatment works for them. You know, they can now safely have a drink. Yeah, uh, I, th I, I think that's such a good point that you bring up, too, because, I mean, how how many people out there, um, you know, maybe they're borderline, maybe they're not borderline, maybe they <laughs> maybe they drink, they just drink too much. You know what I mean? They yeah. just drink too much. It, maybe it's not it's not something that's affecting their jobs. You know, it's not effect, but at the same time, there's that little inner voice that they want to stop, but they just don't, they just don't know how, you know what I mean? Or, they, yes. or it's, it's just so it's such a, there's such a normalcy bias in drinking in our society that, um, I think that tends, I know with me, definitely it allowed me to justify what I was doing and say, it's just no, it's everyone else is doing it. I'm mean, the classic thing, right? Everyone else is doing it. Then my dad come right. in and say, well, if, if Johnny jumped off a bridge with you, I mean, this, the dumb old saying <laughs> right. or whatever, but it's true. You kind of, it's like, okay, I'm kind of just, just, you know, doing what he's doing. I'm not as bad as that guy. You know what I mean? And so well, it's, it's also, so, it's, it's legal. It's a, it's the most, huge. It's, it's a, yes. it's a legal drug. I mean, alcohol is a, like sugar is a legal drug. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And of course you're going to go with peer pressure, but also just because everybody's doing it. I mean, yeah. everyone talks about the European way of drinking. Well, yeah, they have a glass of wine at lunch and a glass of wine at dinner. Now, if, the, if they were an individual who had the genetic predisposition and they did that for 50 years, I can guarantee you, they wouldn't be having a glass at lunch and a <laughs> glass at dinner. Yeah. That's, that's the difference. And, and you know, it, it, that's, that's why it's so important to, to really look at the individual. Now, mind you, the Sinclair method also can be used as a, a sort of prophylactic for teenagers that are binge drinkers or that, um, let's say their parents, uh, uh, have alcohol use disorder. Um, they could actually start using the Sinclair method prior to it becoming full blown. And I even have, you know, actors who have to lose weight for a role and they're used to pounding a bottle of wine at night, but they're not, I wouldn't call them an addict. Yeah, they just drink. Yeah. They just like they like wine, so they can use it 
to, to you know to reduce from a bottle to a glass. You don't well, you don't this yeah. So it's, it's really can be used by people who even aren't in full blown addiction. Well, that's that's what Seth and I, my my uh, my buddy who I met with this morning, and uh, he's he's kind of one of my one of my my best friends. Really um, paved the path for me to feel comfortable in saying I need some help because he did it before I did. And we've known each other since we were kids. So we've had that kind of common bond, um, throughout this little journey uh, and both of our experiences. And we were talking about that this, this morning again, about how things can be used as tools. And when people use them responsibly, who are able to do that, like a glass of wine for say, um, you know, that that's one thing, but when, when it starts getting to the point where it is progressing so fast that you can't control it, obviously, yeah. um, you know, that that's an issue. And let me, let me back up on something real quick, because this is my fault. I probably should have done this uh, out of the gate here, but let, let me give the definition um, of, of the Sinclair method and the Sinclair method. Um, and I pulled this off of, off of, um, off of your website, the C3 uh, foundation.org, the Sinclair method is a treatment for alcohol addiction that uses a technique called pharmacological extinction, the use of an opiate blocker to turn habit forming behaviors into habit erasing behaviors. The effect returns a person's craving for alcohol to its pre addiction state. So I probably should have said that from the, from the start, but can you, you know, you're, you're more knowledgeable definitely than I am about this. Can you kind of break that down and just explain to, to people listening how that kind of works in, um, maybe to help them understand it a little better? Sure. Um, okay. So let's say in your twenties, you drank lightly and then in your thirties, you, um, you know, became more of a social drinker and it was sort of a five night a week thing in your forties. Maybe you went through a divorce, you started drinking heavier and then you had a couple mornings where you wake up and your hands are shaking and maybe you even drank a couple beers in the morning on occasion. And now you're realizing, uh Oh, I'm, I'm heading towards, uh, I'm heading towards full blown addiction. Um, so what would happen at that point, let's take this 50 year old person and put them on the Sinclair method. So they would start taking it, uh, with no alcohol in their system and they would take their pill and they would, uh, you know, wait an hour. So it's in the blood and, and brain. And then they would, drink normally, like they would drink as much as they were craving to drink, but mindfully and keep a drink, drink log. And yeah. what they would probably notice if they were a responder, mind you, there's a tiny percentage of people who don't respond to naltrexone. They can try nalmaphene, uh, which is utilized in the UK. It's another opiate blocker. Um, they could do that, but let's say they, they're a responder and suddenly they, they've, they, they can't drink that first drink and they pour it down the drain. Now they're going to try it again and again and again. And as the months go on, usually um, after three or four months, they will reach what's called pharmacological extinction. And that's when their brain starts to not think of alcohol. In other words, they're not obsessing about it. They're not worried that the liquor store is going to close. They go to the supermarket. They walk right past the alcohol aisle. They genuinely lose interest. You just lose interest in it. Um, for me, my aha moment was, uh, as I said in the TED Talk, I drove by a billboard that used to trigger me because I had a huge glass of red wine, which was my poison. Yeah. And and I and I looked at it and I went, oh, there's a billboard. Now, Prior to that, for the past year, I'd been driving past that going, man, I'd like a drink, man, I'd like, <laughs> you know, so it yeah. was a complete, completely different, uh, it was like, it, it, I literally pulled over and I, I was very moved. I had to cry because I, I realized my brain was fixed. And that's the thing is it undoes that, that addictive compulsive feeling, uh, thought pattern and compulsive behavior yeah. in the brain. So I felt like my brain was normal again. Now to describe this to somebody who's never struggled from any sort of addiction, whether it's an eating disorder or anything is very difficult because they don't understand it, or maybe somebody with OCD would understand it. It's when your brain can't stop thinking about the one thing you can't have yeah, yeah. or the one thing start you can't do and just start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's why we referred to the people sitting in, in meetings and thinking, okay, I'm here for an hour, but what am I going to do the rest of the time? I'm going to want to drink. I'm going to want to drink. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. it's, it's very difficult to shut the brain up. And that's what the Sinclair method did for me and does for others is it undoes that, that compulsive addiction in the brain. Yeah. I can't describe it any, any more clearer than that. Um, and, and some people do take longer. Some people, um, 
even if they're an immediate responder, their addiction is so ingrained and their habitual drinking pattern is so ingrained that they might take six months or nine months. Some people even have to up their dose from 50 milligrams to 75 milligrams or even 100 milligrams um, because they reach a plateau and they start drinking heavily again. So it's really a process. And that's why I can't just say, you know, here, take 50 milligrams in three months, you're cured. I I don't, I never believe that. And by the way, I don't like the word cure. I like the word remission because what it is, is as long as you comply, you are in remission, much like a diabetic who maintains their blood sugar levels with uh, insulin. You know, you, you have to have this medication if you intend to drink ever again in your life. This is a lifetime commitment. It's not like I'm going to do it for three months and then go off and drink without it because you yeah. will relearn the addiction. You will relearn it. Trust me. Yeah. You know, I, I've been transparent about my non-compliance and my, you know, and, and, and it's, it, you do relearn, relearn it very quickly. It didn't um, work, huh? The non-compliance. The non-compliance. <laughs> well, look at, look, yeah, look, it usually look, doesn't. <laughs> look at any form of treatment, yeah. whether it's, whether it's 12 step or not, if you don't go to your meetings and you don't keep up with your sponsor and you're not yeah. accountable, you're, you're going to, you know, the, 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 that's the same thing as not complying by taking your medication. And all it's it takes, same. all it takes is one bad day. I mean, I can't count how yeah. many times I've heard of, of guys. I had 14 years, you know, sober. I was, I had one, one day I woke up and something happened and I went to the bar after 14. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that, that, that yeah. same story a couple of times. And, oh, um, um, I mean, we have to be vigilant about this thing because it, you know, just like it's been said, it's, it's baffling. It's, um, it's cunning and it will creep up and get your ass, uh, w- without any notice. Yeah. Um, what, That's why so, I, you know, I mean, even people who have five years on the Sinclair method, they have five years sobriety. They, they keep naltrexone on them at all times, just so in case. The, the naltrexone, it's a FDA approved, non-addictive, safe medication. Yes. It's been used to treat uh, alcohol use disorder since 1994. I know when we start getting, and, and even the first time I heard it, I heard the word opiate, right? And that stood out, an opiate no, blocker. No, opiate oh, blocker. is it going to get me high? <laughs> yeah, is it going to, fu- yeah. wait, I'm going to go on opiates to get off of alcohol? No. Wait a minute, that doesn't no. make any sense. But that's not the case, right? This is no, this no, thing no, no, doesn't no. do anything to get you high. It actually blocks the, the, the opiate receptors in your brain. And then yes. that's what eases the... The, the the cravings, right? Let me make something incredibly clear here. If you are on opiates, you cannot take naltrexone. You will go into full detox and you could die. Okay. So if you are, if you have, uh, sub, if you're misusing alcohol and Vicodin or heroin or anything with opiates in it, you cannot take naltrexone. Okay. Um, if you have chronic pain and you use opiates for pain, uh, you know, pain relief, yeah. then you cannot take naltrexone. This is an opiate blocker and it will put you into immediate detox. It will eliminate all opiates in your system. Don't play this. Don't do this at home. You know, that's yeah. it. You have to be opiate free to do this in Claire method, period. So yes, uh, it is an opiate blocker. Um, and, uh, there's the sister drug naloxone is the one that they use to bring people out of overdose. That's the nasal spray and the shot that, that um, EMs and, and I see. various yeah, EMTs use. And, um, it's like $1,000 uh, or something for a shot or something? No, or what no, used to be or is that something else? I'm, I'm no, 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 no. That's Vivitrol. Oh, no, Vivitrol. No. That's oh, what I'm thinking. Yeah, of. yeah. No, no, the, the shot and the nasal spray that cops and, and fire uh, workers use and emergency medical technicians use is uh, naloxone. And that is actually not expensive at all. In fact, you can buy some um, – it's called Narcon. You can buy it at Rite Aid or CVS and you can have it on hand if you have a loved one who's an really? opiate addict and you're afraid of, for them overdosing. Yes, you can purchase that. But um, like I said, now Trexone, not for opiate users, period. If you yeah. use pot or cocaine or meth, fine, you can use it, but not opiates. Not opiates. Um, yeah. Not that I'm saying that, that using those other things are fine, by yeah. the way. <laughs> Everybody, go use pot, cocaine, and you'll be you'll be fine. Uh, Claudia says it's cool. Don't. No, I did not. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. I, do no, not I, do that. Do not. Do no, that. don't do that. So let's deal with alcohol for yeah. now. So yes, it does. It, it it now. Let me also clarify something because a lot of the um, press in the U.S. and around the world has called this the. Um, it, that it removes all the pleasure from drinking. And and that has turned off a lot of people to even trying the Sinclair method. And it's mm. fundamentally not true. It, what it does is it blocks the opiate receptors in, by by enhancing, the, the stimulating the neural pathways and making those bigger. Um, yes, you will not get the exact same reward 
uh, as you normally did from, from drinking if you had a very large reward in the first place. But I have a lot of people who do the Sinclair method who don't even notice the difference. They still enjoy the taste of their favorite drink. They still enjoy the relaxation effect of alcohol. Um, and you can certainly get hammered on the Sinclair method, but hopefully it will work for you that you don't want to. Yeah, and yeah. You just stop after one or two drinks and you say, I don't want any more. And that's the whole point of this. But um, by all means, it does not block the pleasurable sensations. If you're a big you know, foodie and you like the occasional glass of wine, you can do that and you still enjoy it. You just hopefully will not have the desire to finish the bottle. And that's the whole point yeah. of this. It's It's harm reduction, moderation. But as I said before, you can also use it as a tool to become sober. Now, is that is that the case that in Finland, that's where uh, Dr. Sinclair lives, I believe. Is it is it over an 80% success rate, a long-term success rate for people who do the Sinclair method in Finland or in that area? Or how, how does that work? Because I, I some uh, uh, Cormac, good friend of the show from Ireland, um, he had posted something about that months back and I, I reached out to him. I haven't heard back yet, but um, th- there was something I read where they were, they were trying this and uh, it, they'd had a great success rate with it. Oh, it's beyond trying. Um, Dr. David Sinclair was an American researcher and scientist um, who moved to Finland because they had a strain of alcoholic rats and he moved there in the 1980s, I believe. Um, he actually passed uh, away two years ago this May. So, um, yeah, we think of him often. Yeah. Um, so he moved there and devoted 40 years uh, of his life to researching alcohol addiction. And he found, uh, discovered this alcohol deprivation effect, which then led him to start using opiate blockers in, in, in mice yeah. and eventually human beings. Now, what they did in Finland um, is they, they started using the Sinclair method as the primary treatment for alcoholism. And it had such a massive, huge, uh, great response. Um, and such a, and yes, and yes, their success rate is over 80% in the wow. contrail clinic. Um, and it was, it was fantastic. They saved tens and thousands of lives and everything was hunky dory. And then they joined the European union and they lost all the financing mm. for, uh, for, to, to, to basically to, to give this this treatment to everybody that was suffering from AUD. Um, so now people have to pay for it in private clinics and so forth, um, much like, you know, they do in other places. Uh, Great Britain, about, I think, uh, four years ago, maybe three, four years ago, started using um, pharmacological extinction with uh, nalmaphene, known as Selinkro there, and their, their um, subsidized uh, social um uh, medical treatment there actually started the NHS actually started using this treatment, but they do something really wacky is they, they demand that the person also has CBT at the same time. Um, which is interesting because only what 40% of people addicted to alcohol have a dual diagnosis of a mental illness. So that's really unfair to the 60% of people who just need the bloody pill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in, in addition to that, they start cutting people off once their intake is, once their alcohol um, uh, intake is, is reduced to safe levels, then they cut them off from medication. Even yeah. though they know this is a lifetime commitment. Yeah. So if somebody in, in comes back in four months and say, this is great, I'm having two pints of beer a week, then the NHS goes, okay, you don't need the medication anymore. And it's it's completely wrong. That's not the way it yeah. should be prescribed. It should be prescribed as a lifetime commitment to this medication if you continue so to drink. is it difficult to get the naltrexone in the States right now if, if somebody well, is interested in looking into that? Here's the problem. Um, no, it shouldn't be. It's FDA approved and a doctor actually, I wish they would be sued for malpractice if they denied patients this mm. life-saving medication. But when DuPont owned the patent back in the 1980s, um, in order for the, it to get uh, FDA approval, they had to put in, uh, in the pamphlet that, that patients should take it and remain abstinent. Now, all of, subsequently, all these clinical trials that have been done prove the opposite, that the mm. people who succeeded um, with naltrexone were the ones who cheated and drank on it. Okay. So, so <laughs> kind of counterintuitive at first, yeah, but what, what, yeah. what works, right? The non-compliant people, the individuals in the clinical trials who were non-compliant were the ones that had the huge success rate with naltrexone. So even knowing this, DuPont had to put in this pamphlet that says, okay, to, to the doctors, tell your patients, take the pill and remain abstinent. 
Mm. Um, so to this day, that's how doctors are prescribing it, even though a lot of them know better. Okay. Yeah. But they just, but they, they have just to don't, follow the certain they guidelines. They have to follow the FDA yeah. guidelines. And in order to change that pamphlet, it would cost probably upwards of $20 million. That would wow. mean repackaging naltrexone in a different form, renaming it and relaunching it with the correct instructions. That said, you can go to my website, which is c3foundation.org, and you can go under the um, facts page, FAQ, and you can go for medical um, for medical practitioners. There's a, there's a, a whole section there where you can download information for your doctor. You bring that information into your doctor. You tell them what you want to do, that you want to try this pharmacological, targeted pharmacological extinction or the Sinclair method. You can show them my TED Talk. You can show them the book, The Cure for Alcoholism. You can take excerpts from my site. There's everything you need that's downloadable, trifolds, pamphlets, anything you need. You bring into your doctor. You say, look, this is FDA approved since 1994. I want, I want this medication. Give me a prescription. Now, if they refuse, then, you know, you threaten them. No, um, you can <laughs> yes. threaten, them threaten to uh, sue them immediately. Immediately, uh, <laughs> please. Um, worst case scenario, and, you know, legally, I'm not supposed to be saying this, but I am here to help people. Yeah, you can order it online. Got you can it. order it uh, online from, from a various uh, reputable pharmacies, in fact, on my website under the non verified physician well, I, tab. I There's think this tab online resources. I think that brings up a good point too. And we're going to wrap this up in just a few minutes, Claudia. I want to be respectful of your time, but I, you know, about being our own advocate. Okay. So we can, we can, and, and I'm not saying anything about doctors. Doctors know a lot of shit and that's, there's no <laughs> doubt they've went to school, they're doctors, right? But they don't have, it never they don't hurts. Have, they don't know us on the inside out. They don't know everything about us, the individual, because a lot of times we don't tell them everything also. So it's really important for us to be our own advocates. And that means maybe searching around on the internet, maybe going to, to different sites and, and checking things out, doing some research of your own. So I want to encourage everybody, um, as Claudia gives the the website out and, you know, like look around, like check it out, yeah. like look, you know, maybe it's, some, maybe it's a different program that you're thinking about or that you're, I mean, whatever it is, do your own research and be your own advocate. It's so important. Absolutely. I a hundred percent agree with that. And it's really important to, to, yes, to take control, not, not, you know, listen, doctors, Bless them. They only get about an hour or two of addiction uh, uh, um, education when they're in medical school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that the most was eight hours or something over eight years. I I, I remember reading some statistic that was just dire. It was just horrible. Yeah, it wasn't Um, much. Yeah, it's not much. It's a few hours of addiction training. Um, and, And that usually doesn't entail uh, medications such as um, baclofen or camprol or, or, um, uh, or naltrexone, not camprol. And anyway, it doesn't usually, um, include these, these, these medications. It's usually the doctors usually see people when they're at their worst, when they're have liver, liver failure, when they have, um, or when they're in full detox mode and that's towards the final stages, you know, uh, so they're not really used to, um, proactive, uh, usage of, 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 of harm reduction and recovery being proactive and starting somebody before they become a full blown alcoholic on a medication like this, this, this is all new stuff. So yeah, yeah. you really do have to be your own advocate and you have to do your own research and bring in the material, tell them that you have faith in this, that you've really researched it and that this is something you'd like to try. And, and the fact that it's an FDA approved medication should, should sway them in the right direction. Um, and at the end of the day, like you said, just be honest with them, say, I'm worried yeah, about my yeah. drinking and, and this, and you know, maybe I tried X, Y, Z, it didn't work. Let me try this. And hopefully your, your doctor will be receptive. Yeah. And if, and you, then, don't, if you don't get yeah. the answer, you sue them. You know what I mean? Plain yeah, and simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you could also entice them with this little I'm nugget kidding, of information. by the way, folks. No, I know. <laughs> this, this, this is absolutely true. And that is that every single doctor that's on our find a physician page, okay, mm-hmm. their business has increased uh, substantially yeah, because sure. there are so many people in the United States in dire need of a doctor who will support them in doing the Sinclair method. So this is also a money-making thing for your doctor. They're going to get tons of new patients. So it's all good for everybody. I uh, I have one more question for you, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, but, you know, believe it or not, when I started sober guy, by sober guy, I thought, oh, it's going to be a bunch of dudes. You know, that are uh, if I'm lucky enough to have a bunch of dudes, it probably started out with maybe two or three that were my close friends that actually listened to the show. And in the last couple <laughs> of years, it's grown to a few thousand. But um, 
you know, that, that said, uh, we have a, a lot, we have a lot of, um, of, of great female listeners who listen to the show and I get a lot of emails from them. And some of them, my, my wife helps me, um, from the, from the female perspective, uh, and from, uh, the spouse pr- perspective too, because some of them, um, are, are, uh, spouses dealing with, an, with, uh, somebody mm-hmm. who has an addiction problem. Um, I want to wrap this up with this, Claudia, if you, can you just speak, um, if you don't mind specifically to the women out there who are, are struggling, um, you know, who, who are, who are maybe going through, um, you know, some, some issues with, with addiction, with drinking, and maybe they're on the verge. They, they don't know exactly where they're at. I mean, what, what can you help them with? Well, I'll tell you one thing I've learned a lot in the eight years that I've been dealing with people, um, with various alcohol use disorders. And I'll tell you this much women are, are, are a different thing, especially women who have not hit menopause. Because hormonally, a lot of binges are triggered by hormones. And that means when women are PMSing, they might find that they drink a lot more. And this is something that's that has never been researched, but I've noticed. And I have actually had to put people on higher dosages of naltrexone during those times. But a lot of women might want to be mindful about um, where they are hormonally. They also have different challenges um, in their jobs and the guilt of, of maybe drinking around their children or passing out or not being a good mom. I mean, there's so many aspects of this that you really have to find somebody that you trust. I counsel people for free, by the way. Um, and I, you know, I, I particularly enjoy counseling women because they have so much on their plate. A lot of times, you know, I've, I'm dealing with army wives and, and mothers and, yeah. and, and, and women who work and, you know, run a home. And it's, it, it, there's so many com- complexities to it, but just know that there, there could be a myriad of, of, of issues why you're drinking a lot. And there are so many ways to handle it. And there's, you know, there's, there could be a program that we could design specifically for you and you're not alone. Believe me. Um, the, Gabrielle Glazer wrote a wonderful book, uh, about women and drinking, um, her best kept secret it's called. Mm. And it's really about the the chronic issue with women and drinking right now in this country and the whole mommy wine clubs and all this stuff yeah. and the, the glamorization of alcohol. And, and you know, it, it, you're getting mixed signals out there, ladies. You're getting a lot of mixed signals. And if you have any, fr- you know, curiosity or frustration, um, you know, I'm here to help. So uh, sending awesome. you lots of love. Yeah. Claudia, thank you so much for coming on today. If anyone wants to reach out to you uh, or get more information, where could they do that? You can um, reach out to me through www.c3foundation.org. The three is spelled out. You can just Google Claudia Christian and the Sinclair method, and uh, I'm sure I'll come up there as well. Um, There is a contact box on my website that goes directly into my personal email address. Um, There's tons of information I can send people for free. Uh, Yeah, they can reach out to me there. I also have a wonderful documentary that's on Amazon right now. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you can watch it for free. Yeah, it's called One Little Pill. And um, that's also www.onelittlepillmovie.com. You can rent it, own it, or you can watch it on Amazon or Hulu, like I said. Um, I also have a book, Babylon Confidential. Uh, which talks about uh, my journey through through addiction and finding the Sinclair method um, and a bit of Hollywood lore there. <laughs> so, so there's all sorts of ways to find me. If you yeah. Google Claudia Christian and AUD or alcoholism, you'll find me, trust yeah, me. You'll have about uh, 700 movies and TV shows that come <laughs> up that you've been a part yeah. of. So congratulations no, no, I, on that too. <laughs> yeah, and if you play Skyrim or, or yeah. <laughs> Fallout 4, you'll hear me. So um, anyway, yeah. Shane, please uh, send me all the links so we can put this on social media. And it's so Absolutely. lovely to talk to you and carry on your great work. Thanks for listening. You can help support us by leaving a review on iTunes or you can go to thatsoberguy.com and support us on Patreon. Become a patron. Help us keep bringing you the best recovery, no bullshit content. Thanks to our sponsors, Foundations Recovery Network, DXRX Medical, Sober Nation. Peace, love, respect. Keep your blood clean.